Okay, good morning everyone. We're here for this week's town hall meeting and uh, we have a pretty full agenda today so without further ado we're going to uh, jump right into this. I think to uh, start, uh, well, John, I think you were just going to insert somebody in there. Would you like to go first, John? Sure, sure. Okay. Um, hey everybody, it's a big week. If you haven't checked uh, the Google Plus community in the last 24 hours, you missed the announcement that we are now a 501c3 nonprofit organization. Um, that means that we can receive tax-deductible donations directly to our own bank account, and it means that we can stop explaining how our very good friends at the Fab Foundation have been acting as go-betweens up until now. Um, this means we are a full-fledged general nonprofit, and that that hurdle, which can you know, which has taken us a long time, is behind us. So, woot, as we say. Um, earlier this week, uh, Jeff, no, earlier this week, Jorge Zuniga and his team and I were at the Midwest Association of Orthotists and Prosthetists which is a mouthful, in Chicago. and Oh, and Jeremy was there also. And um, Jorge and Gene Peck and um, oh, his name is so close to me. A, a new acquaintance is in um, Rakesh. Rakesh Srinivasan um, presented on their research and I gave a lunchtime talk and uh, are you inviting Peter, by the way? Peter Binkley asks to join. And, I just sent um, yeah. Great. Um, and it was very well received. We, I, I, I learned some interesting things. The, you know, that profession is feeling quite pinched between medical insurers and um, the fact that there's this renegade company that's giving away for free things that are hard to distinguish to lay people from the devices that they charge thousands of dollars for. So we were very, you know, upfront about sharing the concern that we would undermine the industry that makes what we do possible and makes what we do um, interesting. And so I think we'll be working more and more closely with them in the future as well. Jeff Aronstone and I, hello Peter, are um, presenting at the national meeting in September in San Antonio, I believe, and we are now actively develop relationships with the orthotists and the prosthetists. So that was sort of the the week. Um, we're also still adjusting to all of the excitement and the new world that comes from the Google grant, which I discussed last week for a meeting I haven't caught up on yet. And so this concludes my report. Very good. We don't have any questions yet coming in from Q&A. I don't know if anyone on the call has questions for John. Anyone? Well, let's move on then. Jen is up next with some updates on communications. Jen? Here. Oh, there you go. Okay. Um, nothing really for me. I just, um, there's a lot of stuff that needs to go on the blog and I can't do it all myself. So if you have something that you would like to share on the blog, please email it to me and we can work together on a blog post. If you can put the meat in there, um, I can fluff it up and put it out there the way it normally goes out, um, and add photos and whatnot. But, um, for... I, I get um, messages a lot from people saying, this would make a really good blog post. And then um, then I'm left to try to figure out what the heck is they're talking about. So um, if you have something that you would like to share, please um, at least write me up a description that I can start with and go from. Um, because I think we have a lot to share. I just can't handle writing all of them. I, I'm I'm not an entire newspaper, um, or, yeah. <laughs> so um, um, yeah. So that's my main thing. Um, my family and I are are in um, Spokane at the moment. We just had um, another Marvel Live event where we taught three families how to assemble hands 
Um, my nine-year-old daughter was able to teach um, a ten-year-old girl and her family how to make a hand herself. Um, and then there were two others. Um, Peter was able to um, create a, a modified hand for one of the little guys um, and it worked perfectly. Um, so he's gonna um, he's gonna share, I think, about that in the in the group, in the community, um, what he did. Um, and I think that's it. Does anybody have any anything? <coughs> Peter wasn't at that event, was he? No. Um, the Marvel Marvel event was scheduled um, months ago, and then our um, home printer went down, so we scrambled, and Aaron Brown put on his superhero cape and once again printed not only the three hands we needed and, and overnighted them, but um, he also printed extra parts and uh, an extra a left or a right just in case the, the photos were wrong. Um, and then Peter uh, magically made um, one of the really difficult hands, hand shapes fit. Um, with the, uh, by modifying a classic raptor. So um, it, it all went well and then um, we had the we had an, a certified prosthetist from Shriners here at Spokane um, attended and he was working specifically with that child. Um, and then they've invited Ivan and um, potentially some of his students to come um, back here to Spokane and show them how to make them and, and kind of get it into their their um, system here. They just got a 3D scanner, so they're working on on moving up to 3D printing. Cool. Very good. Anything else, Jen? Um, I think um, Marla and I are working on a more um, succinct autoresponder um, to get to get for, the, for our info at email address um, so that people know where to go rather than just emailing info at and then expecting a personal reply. Um, we have too many people emailing us to give each person a personal reply. So that will be coming, I think, shortly. That's great. You should take a look at that guru thing that I sent you yesterday when you get a chance. Yeah. It, may, it may be very helpful for you and for Melina and for Maria and anyone else who is in the ping pong game of email responding. Yes. Anybody else? Okay, well, let's move on then. Uh, up next is Kristen with an update on Penn State University's work. All right, so I'm kind of new to the Enable community, I guess, but my name's Kristen. Um, I'm a mechanical engineering student at Penn State. I'll be a rising sophomore. And right now I'm the president of a new club that we just created this past spring called Digi Digits. It's a mouthful. <laughs> But um, we're a new club, and right now we're basically dedicated to helping contribute to and expand the Enable community. Um, we have about 60 members in place right now. Um, a lot of them are architecture and engineering students, but, you know, as we really, you know, plan to expand this fall, you know, we could get a lot more of a student base. And uh, so we actually already completed and sent in our first test hand, despite having like four weeks left in the semester after we uh, first, um, you know, after we first kind of came together as a group. So we're really excited about that, and we're looking forward to being able to, uh, you know, contribute to the in the fall. So right now, part of our student base is we have two teams. Um, within our club. We have our production team, which is going to be a lot of under um, underclassmen students who are going to be working with the two 3D printers that were actually getting donated to us. Um, and they're going to be printing and assembling anything that we need, whether it's a hand for a child or um, or you know something that we want to have tested and you know maybe try something new out. So we have that. We're really excited about the three D printers that we're going to be getting. I think they're Lowell's bots. Um, and then we also have our research and design team in place. And this is what like we're really really excited about. And we think that we can really contribute as a university to this. Um, so our research and design team is going to be working on creating a new 
hand, actually. Um, we noticed that a lot of the hands require a wrist and, you know, some wrist movement within that. Um, and we did some statistics, you know, we looked up some statistics and found that, that there's actually a larger base of children, especially, that actually just don't have a hand at all. So what we're going to be working on is a prototype this fall that's going to only require an elbow. And we're going to figure out, you know, obviously we haven't really um, gotten much together with that yet, but we're going to figure out, you know, how to how we're going to move the fingers, um, what movements are going to move the fingers, and kind of how to connect that all together and make a hand that can be driven by someone that only has an elbow and a shoulder, really. Um, so we're really excited about that. One of the functions that when we first contacted Enable that we're going to try to include is, um, you know, being able to write. Um, one of the things that we found was a lot of kids actually lose their dominant hand after they've established a dominance to that hand. So we want to give that back that, you know, ability to write or make it easier for them to write. And we also want them to be able to, like, hold an eating utensil, like a fork or a knife, um, and, you know, open a door. A lot of things that, you know, we may take for granted and that are kind of difficult to create in a robotic hand, but we feel like we really have the resources and the intellect to start creating that. So we're really excited about that, and that's primarily what we're going to be doing this fall. Um, a lot of our funding is going to be coming through sponsors, which we're working on over this summer. And we're also working um, planning to work on kind of expanding the Enable community. Um, we feel that there's a lot of lower class, um, you know, areas that may not have access to the technology and may not realize that Enable is an option for them to give their child a prosthetic device that is affordable to them, um, especially, you know, through us because we're going to have the hands all covered by sponsors, so the family doesn't have to pay for the hand if they're not e able to. Um, so, you know, breaking into... Um, some lower class communities that, you know, may not realize that Enable exists and trying to expand that is also something that we're really interested in working on. So that's where we are right now. Obviously, it's kind of hard for us to really get together over the summer, but our executive board, um, there's actually 11 of us, it's quite a large executive board, but we're really working together to have this all in place and ready to hit the ground running in the fall. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Exciting update. Thank you, Kristen. Of course. Um, Kristen, I want to make sure that you're um, you keep an eye out for a number of existing elbow actuated arms that are already knocking around. You're familiar mm -hmm. with the Raptor Wing from Crichton University, the RIT mm -hmm. arm, um, the Flexi arm, and Peter, you have a new one too, right? Elbow. elbow uh, actually, uh, the one that I'm working on is not elbow actuated at all. It's it's uh, going to be shoulder actuated. It, it um, there are going to be two um, uh, plates that lay uh, over uh, this um, the scapula, and it'll actually actuate by hunching your shoulders forward, which will pull a cable, and that will actuate the, the hand. Got it. Um, the blog post for us today. Um. um uh, Chris, uh, I also uh, wanted to pull your attention to a named, I think, Brandon, who wrote the this weekend, who's written a startup for Universal Club. And what he understands, and what I want to make sure you all understand, is that you guys are prime pioneers and um, example setters. So you would do a huge service and multiply your impact many fold if. As you're working out what you've obviously figured out how to do, you also create a document that other universities can use um, so that they don't have to invent quite as much as you're inventing, and mm -hmm. so on. And um, frankly, I'll, I'll make a note to put you in touch with, I hope his name is Brandon, I can't remember, <laughs> um, and suggest that you guys begin thinking about, I'm making this up as I speak, an association of a university enabled clubs or something. Okay? And so yeah. We'll support you as we can, but you know, let us know how you think it should go. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And we, we uh you know, we are aware that there are a lot of um you know, elbow actuated arms in, you know, already out there. Um, we're obviously not going to be infringing on any, you know, rights that any of them have. Um, but seeing it as, as it is open source, we do feel that we can, um, especially on a lot of the, a lot of the open source models, um, you know, kind of expand and maybe help improve or 
um, customize something for a family that would need it. I know one of my friends that goes to uh, Duke University works um, with a Nicaragu Nicaraguan um, homeless, or not a homeless shelter, I'm sorry, a domestic violence shelter for women. And uh, one of the women actually had her arm chopped off by her husband. And so one of the things that we would really like to do is, you know, eventually be able to work to build her an arm, especially since it's... Um, you know, obviously they don't have a lot of the resources out there. So sure. something that we're really interested in is also, you know, working with other countries, especially when people situ in with people in situations such as that where, you know, we feel like we can really make a difference for some people. Fantastic. Um, the person who's not named Brandon is actually named Joseph Fairley. There's his email. And if you would paste your email, I'm going to forward his note to you and I'll put you guys in touch. Okay, you'll have to give me a minute to figure out that, but I will do my best. Oh, here we go. Okay. Okay, thank you for that update. <laughs> um, next, moving on to Molina, I think, who has a dual update for us today on the matching world as well as your travels to Panama. Um, so the matching world things will get out of the way quickly. Um, as John has mentioned, mentioned Joseph fairly, um, he gets around a bit. They they have offered to help um, with our matching endeavors as well. Wow. Um, to loan us a student to help, which will be wonderful. Um, and we're continuing with our um, testing of the matching app. Um, the school that I will talk about in a moment is also, they have helped us create a wiki that we will be working on this weekend. Um, right now it is it has been started, but it, it needs to be fleshed out and um, made or made into a, real, a, a useful tool. Um, so on to our adventures of the week. Um, John Wong and I had the pleasure of leaving Saturday and joining a school in Panama called the Knightsbridge International School. It's a school with, um, I believe, kids from 14 different countries. Um, and there are some Panamanian students there as well that um, it, the teachers that work there from Panama are allowed for their children to attend. Um, they had two children that um, came on board to receive hands. from. One was from Panama City and one was from an outer, um, an outer town in the country. So um, Sunday we visited the school, went over what we were going to do and helped with a few things. And then Monday, the families of the two children um, joined us so we could get to know them and work with their children to see exactly what they need. Um, one of the kids needed an elbow actuated device, um, but we were able to give him a standard Raptor that fit over his elbow and he is using that as a wrist for the moment which he was very happy because it's quite large and um, he thought it was amazing. His twin brother um, is now wishing he had one as well. Um, so we went through the day with them, worked with the students, some who were just absolutely amazing. Um, it's, it's amazing to watch children behave in such an adult way wanting to help so avidly with what we're doing. Um, so Tuesday, we went to the school and the families returned, as well as representatives from the Panamanian government, from um, their Social Security Administration, their rehabilitation system, and a group called Sonatus, which is their um, social, kind of like our human resources here. Um, John Wong gave a lovely presentation that he has been giving to schools that um, went through everything that we do and, and the technical aspects as well as the, the, what we do to help and even included the two little dogs that have been helped at the end uh -huh. which everyone loved of course um, and then we moved into a question and answer kind of, of portion which was wonderful we had their surgeon who represented the their national group of, for Panama um, by the end of the session she was asking if we could help with some of her patients um, because they don't have the resources there to do it, what is being required. Um, everyone was smiling the entire time. I, I don't think there was a person there that didn't believe in what we're doing. I was, it was all of their medical professionals, all the representatives from the government just welcomed us with open arms and were grateful to have us there. Um, 
once that was worked through, we answered all the questions, we moved on to actually giving the devices to the kids. Um, and of course, you know, there was, as always, the big smiles and all of that, but these government officials who are so professional and there for the one reason of, of just the technical aspects of what we do, had tears in their eyes and excused themselves from the room. Um, it was just amazing. Um, so we spent the rest of the day with them. I talked to a few of the representatives one-on-one, um, -on -one, and by the end of the conversation, um, they're hoping that they can bring us to their public school system to replicate what we've done with KSI, and um, they would like to help us test some of our newer designs coming out. And it was mentioned um, if we should so need it in the future, um, the offer of a building that we can use there. Um, and the school itself has offered us a dedicated room in the school to use as a service center where parents can come to learn, recipients can come to have things fixed that are broken to be fitted. We can offer the, the classes there to become certified and in the different areas that hopefully we can offer in the future. Um, and hopefully we can spread this to the, the outer regions in Panama because you have the, the big concentration in the city of the population, but there's so many areas to reach that, that just don't venture that far. Um, so the next day, rather than, it was an unplanned day. We were supposed to end our visit with the school on Tuesday, but um, I decided to go back Tuesday mor or Wednesday morning. And I was given the opportunity to visit the classes one by one, K through 12. Um, one of the ones that you, you visited 12 to 12. 12 to 12, yeah. 12. Well, we didn't see 10th because they were taking a, um, a test. But we did see that, yeah, so 12 classes. Um, we took in the hands on a big table because they didn't really have the time to interact with them. Let them play with the hands for a little bit, just, you know, see what they could do. Um, we had my son, Ethan, on a display where he could actually talk to them via Hangouts and the kids were asking him questions and um, he was talking back to them and they got a chance to actually meet him and, and I think that impacted them in a great way because they had been told so much about him through videos and different things that the teacher Mickey had um, given to them prior to this. So um, I took the opportunity to go beyond what we do as far as the hand and help teach the children the spirit of what we do. And um, once they got done looking at the hands and they all introduced themselves and told me where they were from, I introduced myself and told them what I work for, what the community does, or, or what we represent, and then asked them, what is it that you really think we do? And they were all, oh, you make these cool hands. And I said, no. And they all just looked at me like, what? And I told them that we, we do small things to help change the world. And then I talked to them about having that one kid at school that just no one wants to talk to because they're weird or whatever it is and how we don't know what goes on in their life and what makes them that way and why they're quiet or, or whatever their, their behavior is that makes people think that they're weird. Um, and asked any of them if they had ever talked to that kid. And there was very few yes replies. Um, and then I brought up to them about their, the people that empty their trash and are behind the scenes. No one really pays attention to them. And they clean the bathrooms and all this. And asked them if anyone had ever told them thank you. And again, very few replies. Um, so we worked through how children may not have the means to do the big things that we can do because we have, you know, we can get around more than they can. But just by saying hello and saying good morning or sitting with that one child that doesn't have anyone to talk to, you can really impact their life them knowing that someone just cared enough to spend that few minutes with them. And um, they, they were getting it, but, you know, they're kids. So I took that chance, since they were so enthused with Ethan, I, I said, so you all like Ethan? Y'all think he's cool. And they're like, yeah, why couldn't he come? We want him to come visit and everything. And I said, but do you realize he was that kid? And it, I mean, they, they all looked at the floor. It, it suddenly impacted them with a real example of how 
they put aside anything to do with him that was different because they thought it was cool that he was getting to do all this stuff in the hands and all this. The other kids could be that cool too. So in essence, it just brought the spirit of what we do because the hands are the coolest thing in the world, but I myself don't look at it as that is the end result of our actions or the reason behind that. I think we can expand way beyond just the hands and spread what we do as the spirit because that's what everybody really needs to embrace. So um, I hope we get to go back. <laughs> um, I hope we get to spread this to the whole country and make this an example of what can be done because I think if one government truly embraces us and helps us to spread what we do, I hope other countries will get on board as well. And um, it could be an amazing thing. I hope you get to go back too. <laughs> I, I don't think I don't you could ask for a better representative. Uh, that's, that's very touching. No, thank you. That's just great. That's just great. So we really have to figure out how to, yeah, how to, how to spread the story. You guys have got pictures. You've got videos. You have stories. Um, we should spread them around. We should get back in touch with the people you visited, and get their help in spreading the word, and then in replicating it because it's it sounds just fantastic. Uh, you know, in this respect, I will say with special um, uh, attention to any educators who are tuning in, that in the next few weeks, um, we're going to send out an email to all of the schools, and Melina, I want to you know, discuss this with you, but I think it's a, it's a good plan. Melina would send an email to all of the schools and all the teachers who are probably preparing lesson plans and things for this kind of event. Um, for various ways in which this becomes a learning activity in schools. And and organize with, I think, the, the leadership of Nisha Rahim, who's a new friend of ours, um, just a series of open houses like this in which we pool lesson plans and share our notes and our ways of talking to the kids and help make this whole pool of approaches and resources and ways of teaching this and lesson plans and models available to all of us. So I think uh, I think we're we're making headway on developing ways of making this just a great activity for kids, and not just because it's about printing hands, but because it's about exactly what Melina said. It's really about so cool. I think that would be wonderful. I, th I think there's um, there's a lot of opportunities. Well done, Melina and John. Thank you. And, and, and kudos to John. John is amazing. I have to say, all you men out there, he opened every door for me, including my car door, every time. <laughs> so all of you have quite the standard up to, to, to <laughs> against you. Okay. I, I have, uh, the challenge has been set. Now we know what matters to Melina. Okay. Well, no, that's a good lesson to everyone, too. It, it never hurts to be polite. Yes, it is. Yes, that's right. I understand that it's the little things that make a really big difference, it right? It is. It definitely is. And he gave an amazing presentation, too. Um, for people that are doing the different events at libraries and schools, um, it's especially good for children. His presentation, I believe he's posted in the community. I yeah. highly encourage you to look at it and... Um, and talk to him if you have questions, but um, it's it's a wonderful presentation. It's, it's just the right length, and um, it, it kept people interested, and it gives them just the information they need to be able to move on and ask questions later. Fantastic. Thanks, Melina. Okay, I guess I'm up next. Um, I was asked to do some work on some analytics, and uh, I only have a few data points so far, but I'll do a screen share and show what I do have. So let me see here, sharing that. Okay, can everyone see that? Yeah. Okay, so um, starting with kits, uh, John and I talked about this recently and, and felt that it might be helpful to see how many kits are being uh, purchased and consumed. So to date, uh, it 
we have had about 1,530 kits purchased, and of those, about two-thirds are the Raptor kits, and one-third are the Cyborg Beast kits. So um, it was interesting to me that the, the number I've seen floating around as far as how many hands we've done is maybe somewhere in the neighborhood of 700, but when you look at how many kits have gone out, um, there might be a good deal more than that. Um, some of these, you know, might not have actually gone to recipients. Some of these might be people, you know, hands that people put together and, and kept as demo hands or, or what have you. But there's, uh, there's certainly a lot of activity going on. And, uh, of course, not everybody is using kits either. So in addition to the 1,530 kits, there's those people that uh, go and find the materials on their own. So there's certainly a lot of hands being made. Um, I also want to, on a side note, just want to take the opportunity to call everyone's attention to the highlighted discount code that you're seeing on the screen here. Uh, anyone in Enable who does uh, decide to buy a kit uh, should please use that discount code, and that will give you a, a $10 per kit discount so that uh, they're, they're more affordable, and, and uh, I would encourage everyone to use that, please. So what you see here is uh, a pretty... Pretty steady growth from when we started doing the kits. Um, you see a huge spike there in March. That's because of uh, uh, Intel bought uh, 200 kits for an event that they have coming up in August, uh, a handathon event. And uh, there was another significant purchase in February of I, I don't remember how many hands, but that's why those two months were bigger. Moving on, um, I have only a couple of other data points so far. This is the blog visits. Uh, so this is total visits to the blog page on a month-by-month -month basis. Um, you're seeing a couple of big spikes here, one in September of last year, which obviously was from our Johns Hopkins event. That was a, a big uh, um, uh, impact for us, and we saw that continue for several months thereafter. And then the other spike that we see is around the March time frame. And I don't know, you guys helped me out. I think maybe that was around when all the superhero-type news started coming out and that kind of thing, and the... The Marvel That's the New York Times article. The New York Times article. Ah, okay. Good call. So uh, you can see the impact of that publicity here. And if we look at Facebook likes, it's pretty much the same pattern. Spikes in September and March. So the, the Facebook page likes and the blog sort of mirror each other. You can put those side by side here and, and see that those those patterns are pretty similar. So that's all I have so far. I'm looking forward to collecting a variety of other analytics, um, things like Twitter, things like number of uh, uh, hands being made through the you know statistics that the matching uh, community is gathering, and other statistics will be added in here as I get them. This is all I've been able to gather so far. But if anybody does have uh, data that is being tracked, if you could please share that with me, just anything on a month-to-month -month basis that we could use to, to see trends and, and patterns. Um, please send that my way, and I'll incorporate that in here. That's great. That's great. Um, it would be really interesting to compare the identities of the people who got kits with the identities that Melina knows about in order to get an estimate of the degree of overlap, because that would probably help us adjust our estimates about how much activity we're actually tracking through the matching process and perhaps adjust our estimates as to how many hands are actually being made. Hmm. Okay, I can work with Molina on that. I don't know whether that's something that I can correlate or not, but I'm happy to, I'm happy to try. Cool. Yeah. We'll get together, Jeremy. That's, um, that may be quite the undertaking, John. <laughs> uh, maybe that well, might be something we could get some of these, uh, a couple of the schools to help with, too. Um, maybe. Okay, cool. Okay. Next up we have Maria, and uh, normally I have you on the agenda for the onboarding process, but I believe you have some other things to share today and possibly a new design to look at? Yes. Actually, it's, it's the onboarding process is entirely informed by what's been going on for the past uh, week plus, so uh, I could sort of frame it in the same way. Um, uh, we spoke last week, uh, we had the opportunity to, uh, to go to the Tech Breakfast at Drexel. Uh, we've had a tremendous reception. We've been invited to other tech breakfasts in other areas of the country, uh, but it gave us a chance also to tour Drexel. I want to make sure that... What? Slow down. Yeah. I couldn't hear you. Speak a little slower if you can. Oh, sure. So I wanted to make sure that we put uh, Kristen in touch with our contacts at Drexel. 
because the reception that we got there was very warm, and the students there are working on some very interesting projects. I think that they, uh, I think that we should uh, introduce them to each other, and uh, also uh, I think that that creative spark between the two of them uh, was would be uh, synergistic. Um, it also gave me a chance to appreciate the onboarding process that uh, we could share um, by uh, collecting how people prepare for these kinds of talks. Um, and their work with the media. Uh, the, the next thing we did was we had a, 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 the opportunity to go to the Islamic Society of North America's um, Interfaith and Governmental Forum. And so that gave us a chance to see the kinds of materials that uh, are appropriate for working with faith-based organizations and uh, with governmental relations. And I'm sure that after Melina's experience in Panama, we can broaden that to a, a even wider view, uh, but we got a tremendous reception there, and it, it, the uh, spinning off immediately from that, we got to go to the board meeting for the Compassionate Healthcare Network. Uh, mosques typically have medical centers that serve not just that mosque, but the community that they're in as a whole, and they want to start getting 3D printers for them. They're going to work with the scouts that are sponsored by that faith-based organization. Some of the scouts are in the Northern Virginia area are already with me and have been working with me as early as when Dr. Chi was beginning to teach us before we had held our first workshop. And so uh, we're going to, uh, to leverage that as far as training them and uh, creating uh, the, uh, a, a volunteer process for their medical staff. And, and with that come the seeds of the idea of the onboarding process for a volunteer medical corps who would help with testing, who would be part of the medical advisory board, um, who would help with fitting, and would be a resource uh, for people who are innovating or working with the scouts and are doing local distributions. So uh, then, uh, as if there weren't enough for one week, we had the scouts start their orientation processes with the Girl Scouts. So we've been uh, doing orientation for three troops and for uh, other kids who want to do this as part of their bronze award or their eagle project or their stars and stripes project if they're an American Heritage girl. We have two more orientations like that. And uh, we, we're broadening our, our last orientation. And in talking with John Wong uh, last night, we're going to include a little bit of an orientation during the setup process for the National Maker Fair uh, next week so that people um, all get the, the same speaking points and the, a look at some of the materials. And uh, they also learned the assembly of the, uh, I'm sorry, as part of that, they would also get a, a device review. And then the uh, uh, assembly instructions for a new model that's coming on board. Um, it's being released next week. It's from uh, Evan Booster and uh, Scott Summit with uh, 3D Systems. And it's what they call the K1 hand. <laughs> so but let me see if I can pull this little miracle off here. Hold on. So this is the movie first, and let's see this. so this this gives us a look at the the grasping of it with that small stem. And so you can see some of the recording there. I'm not seeing the video. Is anyone else? Oh no, really? Hmm. No, we're seeing a blank uh, blue screen. Blank blue screen. Hmm. All right, then let's switch to... It's not a blue screen. I think we're seeing your secondary screen while you're playing the movie on your primary screen. Thanks. Uh, that might be it. All right. Take two. Let me try this again. We'll there you go. Well, that's a mean-looking beast. Wow, yeah. And then here are the pictures. So, nice close-up here. You can see this invisible line for the cording here, so it'll be harder to see in some of these other pictures. I'm looking forward to... Also, I've been noticing the green here. We could talk about that in a bit. Another look at it. Interesting gauntlet. On the side, I was looking at these pins. These holes. Here. And do you, have, do you have the design files for this? No, I do not. Evan is 
being kind enough to stay up late at night with Ed. Uh, he is uh, working on the files so that they are they match the schema of 100% being for the, uh, the smallest user, and then scaling up. And cool. uh, as soon as I get the STL files, I have been uh, lining people up to help with the testing process, which I have to say has also been um, a, a huge part of my learning about the onboarding process that we want to make. So let me just I can bring this back here for a second. So that the uh, testing process being that this has been printed on 3D systems uh, cube printers with their materials and is consistently uh, performing well with that. Um, but for our testing purposes, we need at least three other types of printers with uh, the power of threes with uh, three prints in different sizes and having those reviewed before we're passing it on to Melina and her beta testing group. Um, I've been in touch with her a couple of days now about lining the beta testers up for that process and uh, so that we're ready to, to bring that on board. The hope is, of course, to uh, um, have the uh, uh, to, to have the, the hand um, tested and after that to, uh, to write the descriptions up with uh, informed by that process and then to uh, make this available as a uh, as an experimental device as we're finishing that process off. The, the, the testing process has different uh, lengths and so the first one is testing it for a week and giving feedback. The longest process I've heard of so far is five months um, but we're formalizing the write-ups on all these protocols as I assemble the groups who are working on this. And so my onboarding process at the moment for this week was to document everything that I've been learning from everyone that I've talked to and to steal madly from other people who are reinventing or doing the same thing in other places. So I'm, I'm ready at this point to have other people join me. <laughs> so if you're interested in printing or testing um, or that, that, that uh, process, I, I need you because uh, that is a whole neighborhood or a whole world of Enable um, that has a very specific skill set that I, I'd like to work with you on. And then if you are interested in the faith-based organizations package, people like you, John Summit, then I would love to um, have uh, conversations with you about getting those materials together and finishing the uh, material so that we can uh, complete our orientation packages for that. Um, Melina and Mickey and John and I have been talking about the relationships that they've had at Knights Bridge, the relationship that I was talking about with um, different schools here and with the uh, medical centers here. And so that touches on a kind of affiliation program with that service center, a place where somebody could uh, go from their neighborhood to get a tune-up or a replacement and skills so that they could pay it forward. And uh, so that's a different kind of affiliation from the affiliation we have right now with uh, with Evan and Scott and 3D Systems, where they're innovating, they're going to enter that K-1 model as their entry into the VA Innovation Center Challenge, and uh, uh, they're going to be working with uh, Jeremy and Andreas on getting that open source licensing completed. Um, they're working with, with me and my, uh, uh, my instructions designer from the Raptor to, uh, to get that kind of material support in place. I know. I wish you could do it fast enough, but you know, even if I stay up 24-7, I cannot get that done in time for the orientation on Monday night. But it is something that we can do and uh, that we, I'm sure we'll need to put in a different format so that we can update it better than the Raptor um, and get people's feedback on so that can update without exploding. Um, and so uh, we have a lot of things happening and it's all in form the uh, orientation process. So if you'll forgive me, we are doing a lot of things at once. And uh, it's time for the people to say that this is something they're interested in. And if that's the neighborhood you want to live in with me, I will see you at that neighborhood's coffee shop in a virtual way. Contact me. We'll get in touch and we'll have some sort of kickoff to get that group working. But how am I going to keep up with you people? You do so much. Well, uh, <laughs> look who's talking. <laughs> yeah, exactly the phrase I was looking for. That's right. Um, if you saw my shaking, me shaking my head in, in what might have looked like despair, it was actually in, in, in amazement. Um, <laughs> that's only because you know what's going on behind the scenes to make the whole Maker Fair week kick off. Well, that's right. That, that's right. I just want to call out a few of the things I think I heard you say um, in that blizzard of interesting developments. <laughs> it sounds like 
and you're, I assume you're, you're interacting with Joe Cross and Melina and um, others about the testing process, that you're sort of formulating a testing team or a testing neighborhood, right? Yeah. It's one cluster of activities that's well-defined. You're talking about faith-based organizations as another sort of focal area, and I guess you mean neighborhoods by that. Um, and then there's this whole affiliation space, and uh, we've talked about the universities, we've talked about K-12s, you're talking about international and so on, and you're calling all of those neighborhoods, and you're develop you're, I think I heard you saying, I would like people to start, I would like the adventurous people to start contacting me if they want to begin fleshing out these neighborhoods. And my only caution is uh, if you're literally going to have people email you directly, you're going to be where I was this morning, which was just trying to respond to emails. But it's fantastic. You can sort of see this stuff coalescing. <coughs> but your head's going to explode um, unless we can figure out how... It already has, right. Unless we can figure out how to make this self-service, which I know you're also working on. Mm -hmm. Right? So, no one really wants to see my head explode. <laughs> There's too much goodwill in here to do that. So I, I know that people will step forward and that um, I also know that you all are such adventurous people that um, you're not afraid of this kind of frontier. So, um, and, and I can't explore at all. I'll, so I, I'm, I'm content looking like Dory the Explorer, but at, at this point I would like to have other adventures. Go grab that map. <laughs> okay, thank you all. Thank you. Okay, I think uh, that brings us to our, our final update for today, which is JC with the event calendar. Right. Um, we've got a bunch of stuff that's been added to the calendar because we had several maker fairs approved. We had Detroit approved, we had Atlanta approved, we had Eugene, Oregon approved, and I think we had another one approved and I don't have it right in front of me. So actually there was some discussion of putting together talking points for people who were at presentations. If I could either get some of that or be somewhat involved with that, I'd like to be able to, people who have contacted me because they want to represent us at a maker fair, if it's not someone like, say, you know, like John who, who's done it and knows it really well, it would be good to have a resource I can point them to to say, here's some information to sort of help you out in your process of wanting to do that. Um, other than that, with event support, um, I've today sent out two more demo hands of the dental band fingers for, um, for, for people who were taking them to shows, and I gave, got one to John um, to bring down to Panama as well. And the other thing, and it's kind of minor in sense of what everybody else is doing, is we redesigned that little logo so that it's a paper clip and people can take it and use it as a bookmark when they... Um, uh, visit a table. They're very, very easy to print. They take no time at all to print. They are great for using the dog ends of a roll of filament if you, because it doesn't take very much. And um, you know, if you all keep sending me events so I can get them on the calendar, um, when things slow down a little bit, we should port over the new calendar to the website because as a result of it not being there, I'm actually entering everything in two different calendars. So it would be nice to cut my work in half in that respect. But I realize that that's not really the priority right now. There's so much going on. JC, for those listening, can you give us the address again for where they should email event information? Sure. It's events.enable at gmail.com. Justine? Yeah? It's Maria. I'm sorry. I just wanted to let you know that, um, that with Jen being on the road this week, um, that, that had an impact on being able to approve the changes to the website. So, That's okay. But you're dear. Thank you so much for for managing two calendars simultaneously. I will never complain about managing my own calendar again. It, it's not so bad. It'll just be easier, I think, because I want to make sure I don't forget to put something on one or the other. Um, but Maria, at some point, I have to talk to you about some of the calendar stuff. But so I'll get in touch with you after the maker fair is over. Oh, good. Thank you. Because I think that can wait till after the national maker fair stuff. And let's just be clear, National Maker Fair is one week from today, and the next day, Saturday, 
Um, and lots of people are going to be there, including you, dear listeners, if you're in the neighborhood. Oh, including Jeremy. Yeah, I'll be there. Oh, that's right. That's great. Okay. So, Jeremy, Peter, are you going to be there too? You can nod your head. Yes. I will be there. Maria will be there. Um, several uh, possible collaborators and partners will be there. And a good time will be had by all. Including that bird. <laughs> That's mine. Sorry. I, I do have one other interesting thing. We, we've talked about um, different periods of time since I've been in the community about the normally closed hand. Um, Ariel Yanni, who is also in um, Panama and has helped the school with some of their printing, um, he has done one of those apparently successfully where it works very well. So, um, unfortunately, the kids at the school didn't realize that that was something that was kind of special, so they reworked the hand to do it with the <laughs> normal um, so I didn't get to actually witness it, <laughs> but I'm going to get with him and see if he can do another one and um, let us see what he did that was different because um, it sounds like it, it worked very, very well. So we just gave a, actually I'll give you a couple of mini updates in one minute I will allow myself. We just gave Lucy a new arm with a normally closed grip that Chip has been pioneering and it's, it's a really good idea. It means that you can just lay it onto a handlebar, for example, and it should grip. Um, Elizabeth recently also had a very successful presentation of the orthotic arm to young Tandon also, uh, which, by the way, is a normally closed design because his hand clenches until it's open. This is the one for um, the kid who has an intact hand but can't control his fingers, but now he can. So R&D proceeds apace in many ways. We actually had a gentleman who came with the, uh, the government representatives, that an older gentleman that would like to um, give the airy arm a go in the future if he can. Well, cool. Okay. Put us in touch. So uh, did any Q&A come in from the... No, I was just going to say, nothing on the Q&A today. Um, if anyone has anything, let's uh, get the questions in now. Peter, do you have a um, Yeah, I can talk a little bit. Uh, there was a um, modification I did for the Marvel event. Uh, I could uh, let you all have a look. I think I, I, I actually um, might have showed you uh, last week at the at the uh, the roundup meeting. Um, but uh, let's see here. That's that's how it look. Now it's been now tested. Uh, yeah, now that it's been tested and it's been successful. So here's the client. Can you see it? Yep. 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 Okay, great. Uh, and um, so uh, to the left is a uh, regular old uh, Raptor, the Raptor Classic. Uh, and uh, to the right is uh, the same thing, but I was able to uh, reshape the, uh, the interior, well, and the exterior. Uh, and this is uh, largely because, whoops, not that one, uh, because of the... Um, the very very blocky design of the uh, of the 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 Raptor Classic, uh, and that that was actually my intention when I when I first made it uh, so um, I guess blocky, uh, but this was this was the first instance of not only me making a modification but also getting feedback from from the makers and uh, uh, who were uh, in contact with with the client so. Uh, so that was uh, that's very exciting because I can teach people to do this and and I can do it fairly quickly. Um, so uh, normally, like if we just tried to take a regular Raptor and scale it for this uh, eight-year-old, I think eight-year-old child, it would have had to be about a hundred fifty percent or maybe more, uh, which would be enormous, just enormous. And um, uh, so we were able to get this down. This is actually a one hundred thirty. Uh, so that was uh, that was very nice, very welcome, and you can see that the uh, that the gauntlet, the bracer here, fits fits well too. Um, I should also talk a little bit about this um, this project. I've been I've been calling this the Osprey, uh, but 
uh, it's so much like a Raptor. You know, it's got the same. It's got the old Raptor interior because I, I like the low poly. It's able to. I'm able to to modify it very quickly. Uh, so maybe it's Raptor Gamma or something. But anyway, it's got a new hood. You can see it's got a, a nice little fairing there. Uh, this little bit more, uh, a little bit less blocky, a little bit more organic. Uh, of course, the <laughs> the bracer here is is uh, still totally blocky, <laughs> um, but um, it uh, it goes with set screws, and the idea is uh, it uses uh, heavy gauge nylon monofilament, basically fishing line, and so there's no elastics. There are no elastics in this design, um, and uh, I've got I've got some parts actually uh, printed here. Let me let me check and see if there was anything else I wanted to screen share before I jump off of that. Um, no, that's that's about it for that. Um, sorry, let me jump off a screen share here so I can. Uh, uh, there it is. Boom. All right. <clears throat> so I'm I'm in the process of assembling one right now, um, but uh, these these holes on the top are for set screws, and they actually the 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 cabling uh, goes down this channel. The set screws hold it in place. And there are uh, two set screws per cable, so it should hold it pretty securely. Um, the uh, to tie the knot in the end, you don't actually tie a knot at all. You just um, uh, you just melt the end here until it makes a little bit of a ball, and then you pull it so it goes into the fingertip, and you pull it tight, and that is tied. So that's in there. Um, and uh, makes it makes it really simple if you can get a little flame. See that one's done and uh, ready to ready to go. Uh, here, let me put it through here. And all right, Some history in the making here. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, while while I talk, I'll, I'll mention uh, a couple things. Uh, one. Is uh, for the matching process. Uh, one thing that's really difficult to get is um, uh, good client photos. So I started making. Uh, uh, hopefully, uh, I, I, I'm writing a script. I'll be making a video for a tutorial video, uh, taking photos for Enable. Uh, so I can sort of show how you how to set up a scene, talk about camera settings and things like that. Uh, just like a two or three minute video, so that um, so the people on the client end taking photos can have an idea what we need, because uh, it seems like there's a lot of back and forth. So um, let me see here. Oh, that's still not tight enough. Okay. Uh, also, um, uh, Moit Chaudhry from the uh, uh, who did, did the um, uh, Enable Haiti uh, got in touch with me, and I've agreed to um, advise. I guess uh, the the Haiti team, Enable Haiti. Uh, so um, I'll be helping them. Uh, probably be doing design work, but I'll hopefully help them with some, some construction. And uh, my French might even come in handy, <laughs> since uh, that's one of the languages I speak down there. Uh, Tighten this puppy down here. Okay. Yeah, here we go. So that's one finger, and uh, it's uh, it's totally Bowden, so there are no elastics, and uh, there's very little very little resistance throughout the. Here has been additional on my life. Can you see that all right? You bet. Peter, well, how do you, I'm looking at how. How do you deal with those, those set screws if you see the bottle? The set the screws, screws aren't going to fit the same. Would you just use a different size set screws? Uh, yeah, they're different size set screws. I, I've I've tweaked it so that at 100%, uh, a hundred percent, a number six screw or six thirty two is a good fit. This is a hundred fifteen, and I found that if I actually, I downloaded and printed this thing off of Thingiverse. It's a pin vise, and you can uh, you can put a drill bit in, so that so that you're not because Plastic is so easy to drill. It actually makes sense to just hold a drill in your hand in a little tool like this. You can tighten it down. It's just a, like a, and then you can use it to sort of twist 
to twist the hole very carefully. So you can ream out the hole to where the, 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 the right set screw size will fit. This needed just a touch of reaming, not very much, to make it fit right with, uh, with the number 8 screw. It's an 832. But I figured there will be four size set screws. And if you have to do any reaming, um, then it's, you know, it's pretty easy to do. Uh, so number six, number uh, it's 632s, 832s, uh, 1024s, and I think there's a 1220. Anyway, that would be the that would be like for Peregrine, really big. So that's uh, that's pretty much my report. <laughs> pretty darn. That looks like a beautiful thing. Um, you're gonna uh, document it and put it through the process. Yeah. Yeah, I've been working on the different components for a while. In particular, the you know the the low pro uh, uh, bracer has been around actually since the since the Hopkins conference even. Uh, but we put these uh, the set screws for the the Bowden style cabling. And um, uh, what's nice about it is this uh, this bracer doesn't break. It's not like the the when you when you print a Raptor all the way around. So you know how Andreas is trying to solve the problem of breaking bracers with thermoform, uh, thermoform gauntlets is what he's calling it. Um, and uh, I think it's great, and I'd, I'd, I'd like to do that for this as well. But just the way that this prints, see, it, it prints low, uh, but then when you put it on your arm, it actually, your arm actually goes like so. It actually comes up. And then, um, let's see. There are uh, 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 the straps actually come out of these holes. You uh, you get a, you screw the strap in place. You just put a screw through the strap basically, and uh, you strap it down. I mean, you screw it in, and then you can uh, you can um, strap it on. Very elegant. Thanks. <laughs> it's one ten. All right. Anyone, Anyone else? else? Anything else? Maria, Maria said it deserves its own. So you'll have to think. Oh. Okay. I love it. I love it. <laughs> you had no laughter. You're here. Yeah, the fact that there are no elastics is, uh, yeah, I, no, I, no, I, I might still not, decide to call it the Osprey. The thing I was thinking of was um, uh, the either the Velociraptor or uh, Raptor Gamma. If you think of it like Alpha, Beta, Gamma, it's the third alpha, the third letter in the Greek alphabet. So it'd be sort of like the next to go along with the with the Raptor Classic and the Raptor Reloaded and how they how they do kind of fit along the same, like we tried to standardize the measurements for things like finger gaps and things like that. So. I could see this having its own brand. Sorry. I I, I could see the set screws and the no elastics and that angle for the bracers. It's almost as if it's own brand. Mhm. Okay. <laughs> Okay, okay, we, we just had one, one question that came in for you, Peter. What is what the string that you use to call? It's really interesting that it's stiff enough to have Sorry, we had to mute you there for the minute, uh, Peter, but if you could unmute yourself to answer this. They're asking, what is that string that you use called? It's fishing leader, and it's just like it's nylon monofilament. Uh, I'm... <laughs> They didn't pay me to do this. This is where I get mine, though. Uh, and this is 1.4 millimeter. Uh, but I've got, I guess, for a 100%, I'd go to uh, a 1.2. Uh, and for Peregrine users, 2 millimeter, 2.0 for his. So, And it does make sense to have different sizes of this. Uh, the good news is that this uh, costed uh, me ten dollars. It's a hundred yards. It's going to make a lot of hands. Uh, and this is for a seven-year-old. If you can get get the idea, 
I wouldn't go any smaller than, like, for uh, if you're going to use nylon monofilament, I wouldn't go any smaller for anybody, um, any smaller than one millimeter. And and if it's if it's actually one whole millimeter thick, I would say that's for a small child. I'd go a three or four year old kid. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, no okay, more no questions, questions at this time, right. and uh, I think we are a little past our allotted time, so I think uh, we should probably wrap for the day. Thank you, everyone, for joining. <laughs>